Hello, okay, wake hello. up, Steve. Steve right. Get yourself together. Yeah. Um, hello. Welcome. Listen, I am Steve Lambert. I'm Steve Duncan, and this is our webinar. Um, and the this is it's a webinar about basics in creative activism, and the R is Center for Artistic Activism. And what number are we now? We are on number. Da, 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 drum roll, 19. Woo! All right. So today what we're going to do is talk about how change happens, which is one of those big, heady, like, I don't know, philosophical questions. And we're going to try to actually make it a lot more practical um, and talk about it as it relates to artistic activism. Yep. So we're going to cover a few things. Um, Steve's going to talk about how change actually does happen and how art can change society. These are the big questions, and we're going to cover it all in like less than 20 minutes. I know, it's and, amazing. <laughs> and then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how art can change individuals, and I think it's all kind of related, how individuals change society too. Yeah. We'll have some time for questions, and um, that's, that's what we're going to do today. Sound good? Sounds good. So let's yeah. do it. All, all right. right. All so, right. so here we go. Those of you that are um, attending, if you have questions along the way, there's a little window where you can type in questions. Um, we will, if you have questions along the way, we can address them as we go, possibly, or um, get them to, at the end. But our audience always asks great questions. And there's also a chat where we'll put in links when there's related things and stuff like that. So. You might want to look in that right hand column of the webinar control panel and get a sense of where those are before we start. We're also going to ask you questions that um, that uh, you can help answer. So, Steve, let's talk about lenses. It's an earthquake. So, um, you want me to start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, I like to think of these the things that we're going to talk about today as lenses for looking at these kind of problems are lo looking at society, looking at how change happens, um, because the way that this actually works is incredibly complex. And because it's so complex, it's hard to see. So we use lenses in order to get another perspective, a more focused perspective on how something works or how change happens. That lens doesn't show us everything. It doesn't work for everything, but it does help shed some light on the problem. So we're going to use a few of these. They're not comprehensive. They're not complete. They don't work in every situation, but they work in a lot of situations and they'll be helpful. I so. see some metaphor, Steve. That's nice. So um, how does change happen? So, you know, we've been doing this for a long, long time. And we are doing a workshop at the Brooklyn Museum with these organizers from around the world. And this one fellow said Colum from Columbia said, hey, so what is your theory of social change? And we're like, what? Huh? And we realized that A, we have a theory of change that we employ all the time, and B, we never talk about it. Um, and so it was one of those great questions that made us actually investigate our own process. And as artistic activists, our hunch is that you have a theory of change as well. And so this is a way to kind of step back and say, well, how do I think change happens? So we're gonna kind of, Steve said, run through some ways of thinking about change and think to yourself about, okay, yeah, that seems to make sense for me. And we will also talk about what seems to make sense for the practice of artistic activism in general. All right, so how does change happen? Now, there's a couple of theories of change, broad sweeps here. One is, called a natural theory of change. And natural change basically says that change just happens naturally. It has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with humankind. Maybe a meteor comes in from outer space and you know hits the Gulf of Mexico and exterminates all life, okay? Or a more modern Pangea. example is- Pangea expands, continents form. Mountain yes. ranges rise up, and the um, I island bridge connects between the it's continent that is now known as Asia with Alaska and North America, and change happens. Exactly. And you know, before we think about this in this sort of you know way back when, basically, climate change deniers are believe in a natural theory of change. They don't deny that it's getting warmer. What they deny is that human beings have anything to do with this. 
And this idea of natural change even extends to things like politics. Like the ancient Greeks had this idea of kyklos. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but if you're an ancient Greek, you can correct my pronunciation. Um, but it basically meant that cycle, there was cycles or circles of polit politics that all societies would go through from like democracy to monarchy to oligarchy and then back again and so on and so forth. The key here is if you believe in a natural theory of change, there is nothing that we can do to intervene and change society. So now, climate deniers are the are naturalists. They they're not naturists necessarily. They're naturalists. Right, right. They probably yeah. some wear clothes, some don't. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Good to know. So your other model is social change. Yeah, exactly. And this is really, we're betting that most people in the audience, this is the theory of social change, whether you think about it or not, that you ascribe to. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here listening to us. And a social theory of change says change happens because people intervene. Simple as that. Sounds Why is the climate change happening at this moment in history? It's because people have intervened to change fundamental atmospheric conditions and so on and so forth. Why do revolutions happen in systems of government change? Because people get together and overthrow governments. So social change, natural change can be positive or negative. And so that's the hopeful thing, right? Is that we can produce positive social change by actually acting on problems. Definitely, okay. So, good news we need to be reminded of. Exactly, exactly. So that's our first hurdle. Then there's theories, a couple of theories of social change, okay? Um, and uh, the first is material change is what leads to social change, okay? And like, mean? yeah, and what does material change mean? It means that in order for social change to happen, you have to change the material conditions of society in order to change the social conditions of society. So Steve knows this, um, but I used to be a Marxist, yes. right? In fact, I have the Communist Manifesto tattooed on my body um, in a very private place, <laughs> actually not that private. In any case, um, and what Marxists essentially believe that if you wanna change society, you have to change the fundamental material conditions of society. You have to seize the factories, change the means of production, change the laws, change the policies, boom, boom, boom. Once that happens, social change happens. Boom, 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 okay? And I'm still a Marxist um, insofar as I do believe that has to happen. However, the so question, yeah. Material change is like concrete stuff, right? Like, yeah. so policies, like who owns what, yeah. where people are, like people on the streets or people in their homes, right? Like that makes a difference. Um, what the tools that they have, the amount of money they have, things like that, right? Like things that are quantifiable. You got it. Yeah. What other yeah. model of change could there be? Well, the, here's the here's the problem, which is how do you get people to the place of creating material change or accepting the material change that's happened? There have been so many revolutions where people seize the factories, change the government, and then like ten years later, it's just back to the old ways, right? And so you had Marxists like Antonio Gramsci, Italian Marxist, stuck in Mussolini's prison, had a lot of time on his hands, wrote a lot of stuff, who came up with this, uh, you know, the, basically theorized this idea that you need material change, but in order for material change to happen, you also have to change ideas. And so this is the second way of thinking about this. That in order to bring about social change, you have to have change in ideas, how the way people think about the world their common sense ideas of how the world operates. We all know, and Steve, you point this out, there's lots of policies that are actually pretty good on paper, right? Yeah, like my teacher's union. We have a union, it doesn't mean we're winning, <laughs> right? Like, it doesn't mean we're all aligned on the ideas and the ideas are good, right? Yeah, like most forms of racism and bigotry are outlawed, doesn't mean we don't live in a white supremacist society, right? I mean, right. that's just, it's got to change the way people fundamentally think. So, so laws against jaywalking and- it's Yeah, so, those laws are stupid. Right, social, <laughs> so the ideas don't support that law, right? Exactly. So okay. one of the ways that uh, folks think about this is idealism versus materialism, okay? Or materialism versus idealism, right? Now, we actually think it's a false distinction. That's, mm. yeah, ooh, yeah, there we go. And why is it a false what distinction? What do you think? 
What? Then what do we think? <laughs> well, we actually think you have to do both things at the same time. But right. actually, ideas come out of material life, and material life changes the way we think, right? So, yeah, ideas so, come from life. So the fact that my teacher's union exists in my life, I have different ideas about what's possible with my labor situation. Exactly. Exactly. And then life and, comes from ideas. And no matter what ideas you have about your labor situation, if you don't have a union, you don't have the material means to bring about that sort of change. Right. It's basically chicken and egg stuff. Right? Okay. okay now, here's why it's important. As activists, we're going to die. Yeah. It's, it's just that's as that's people. Clear. As people. Yeah. Forget the Yeah. As people, we're going to die. Yeah. Um, most of us are not um, Im immortal. Yes. Just saying. That we know. Um, and so, we, and we also have a limited amount of resources, limited amount of time, and so on and so forth. And it's like, where do we put our efforts? Where do we actually take our unique talents, skills, and so on and so forth, and leverage them in order to intervene and will bring about social change? And essentially, as artistic activists, we are trafficking in ideas, okay? And so even though we think ideas are connected to material conditions, we start at the place of ideas. We don't go out and seize factories. We don't go out and start revolutions with guns. We start with ideas. But, and there's an important but, we're artists. And so it's not like we're writing manifestos. We're not like writing treatises or books. It's a particular type of idea. It's ideas and emotions put together. And this is what makes it so powerful equals you got it, art. So there we go. So, okay, I have a question for you. Yeah, lay it on me. As we start with ideas, yeah. we add emotions, we're making art, and then ultimately are we trying to change material conditions? Yeah, sooner or later we have to. If we don't, then that becomes problematic. But in order for material change to happen, people have to believe it's a good thing and it's possible. Right. And the great thing about art is it's not just working on an intellectual level of ideas like, here's the rational reasons why we should not have white supremacy, right? Yeah. Instead, it works on this emotional level or might say a cultural level. And that's where I want to take us right now is that art is a form of culture, okay? okay. And so the next little bit we're going to do is talk about how art can change society. And from here, we're going to draw ideas from um, sort of one of the, the the founding figures of cultural studies, a fellow named Stuart Hall. And he had this idea that culture is the place where actually change can happen. Now, the problem with culture is it's a massive word, right? Like we use it all the time, but like, what the hell are we talking about, right? Right. Wait, oh, sorry, um, my that fault, my fault. Okay, there we go. <laughs> culture. Okay. Culture. So, what we want you to do is write into the chat that I mentioned earlier. And when we say the word culture, what are the words that you think of? Culture is a big word, an all-encompassing word. So write that in now. We'll give you a minute. And, um, and then we want to see what we get. And we're going to work from there. By the way, while we're waiting, Steve, we're what? Yeah. We're how far into this are we? Less, uh, like 15 minutes in, you yeah. hit marks. You hit Gramsci and you hit Stuart Hall. And we talked about dinosaurs. Yes, <laughs> and Pangea. Okay, Pangea. so um, Oliver says identity. Lauren says, oh, it has a few here. People, society, ideas, foods, homes, art, language, food, architecture. Damn, Damn who did that? That was Anne. Um, Anne also says shared values and norms. Excellent. Bethany, okay. traditions, language, food, music. Karen says race, religion, funding, and access. Anne says traditions and values. AV says um, aesthetic and ethical dimensions. Ooh. Rachel says education. Stephanie Luke says artificial distinction. Nice. What about that. Whoa. I don't even know. Amber nobody, says, no, nobody's put up yogurt yet. No. Amber uh, says beliefs and traditions. Uh, Salette says elitism. She she almost got it. Petri dish. 
Um, patterns of behavior shared by a community, the culture beat, um, the mythological behavioral, that was Lisa and Rachel. Keith says the mythological behavioral material patterns by which a group of people, I think this is from Wikipedia, Damn. relate to each other in specific area of the planet we live in. Um, Daniela, what we envision for ourselves, and then well, this is a collective story we tell ourselves about ourselves. That, that, woo, good. You know, we have some pretty sharp people out there. Yes. Um, so guess what? Everybody's right. <laughs> yeah. Essentially, one of the ways to think, and this is what's so helpful about this Stuart Hall's distinction, he talks about culture um, with a small C and culture with a big C. Um, and all the people that said things like art and books and so on and so forth, um, videos, graffiti, art, you know, poems, TV shows, books, music, magazines. I would even put food up there too, even though food is one of those great things that traverses both qualities, is that this is culture with a capital C. It's like culture as an, um, an art historian might think about culture, right? And as artistic activists, this is what we produce, right? We actually produce capital C culture. Now, culture is also everything that people talked about when they talked about language and they talked about folk ways and they talked about pathways of living and so on and so forth. Um, things like food, style, work, law, language, religion, sport, all of these things which are everyday rituals and some of these also cross over are what Stuart Hall calls culture with a small c and it's culture as sort of an anthropologist might understand it. Now these two definitions of culture are of course related to one another, okay? Um, the big C culture, and this is the Q, boom, okay, actually leads to small C culture. Insofar as how we pattern our lives has a lot to do with the representations that we're given of how we should pattern our lives, okay? And what do I mean by that? Just a very simple thing is no matter how, you know, righteous you are, still every time you fall in love, there's a rom-com movie playing in the back of your mind someplace, right? That is, is that, you know, it's a genuine love you have. It's the language, your everyday language you're sharing with this most intimate partner you have. And still someplace there's just like Hugh Grant. You're thinking, this is like that movie. I'm in love. <laughs> exactly. And so this is something, you know, basically to say that, that one of the ways we think about what a good life is has to do with, these sort of ideas of culture. Now, rom-coms are kind of, you know, probably give us bad ideas about romance, okay? But you can imagine so many poets, um, you know, Sappho, for example, have beautiful ideas of what love is about, right? And so these are ideas that we can use also to think about what is a good life, what is good love. Now, small C culture also then influences big C culture, okay? Insofar as what we deem as good poetry, what we deem as a good movie has everything to do with our everyday experience in the world. That's why when you watch, you know, you, Steve, I went to a film school that Steve now teaches at, and I had to suffer through so much bad art. And why that bad, why, why that art was so bad quite often. Um, and I was why, teaching there. What? No, no, Steve teaches, the good, Steve teaches the great art, okay? Um, was because it basically didn't speak to our society at all. It just had to do with just the individual and his or her own idiosyncratic way of seeing the world. Great art is something which allows us to reflect upon our everyday culture, but also draws from it as well. Um, so these things are interconnected. Now, it goes back to that natural social thing. So where do we start? Like, where do we intervene? And what we do is we intervene at the level of representation. When we stage an action, when we do an intervention as artistic activists, what we're doing is we're entering into this system at that level of representation or aspiration. We are creating a model for how we think the world should look. We can create that model with other people. We can create it ourselves. That model can be critical. It can be aspirational and utopian, but still we're putting forth an idea and ideal of what the world should be like or a critique of what the world should not be like. Now, if it stayed there, who cares, right? Yeah. 
And, you know, because then it's just like you're going to an art museum or you're going to an art school and you see all this art and it's like, oh, that's a really biting critique of white supremacy. That's amazing. Wow. Okay, so where are we going for a drink? Um, <laughs> they have wine at the opening. <laughs> they have wine. Exactly. We don't have to go any place, right? Um, and it doesn't do any good if it stays at that level. Our goal as artistic activists always has to be create capital C culture to have an impact on the everyday patterns and behaviors of life. That's right? the goal. That's the goal, okay? Because then once we do that, then we can change material conditions and change material conditions in such a way that people support those changes and those changes continue on. Does that make sense, Steve? Right, yeah. I have a question for you once we get through this, but um, yeah, so the idea is that by presenting another way with the idea that of influencing the way that people live their everyday lives. Yeah, right? yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the end goal. And then the end, and then we don't stop there. Um, the point of influencing everyday culture is then to bring about material changes that have influence on people's lives and which then, of course, impacts this representations and it's this cycle back and forth and back and forth. Then we have the wheel is moving and we're the wheel moving. is moving. We've got the revolution. Everything's good. And this is why serious social movements always have cultural components. You know, be it the civil rights movement or the feminist movement or labor movements, um, revolutionary movements, they always take culture seriously because those sorts of, you know, creating an idea of why we're having this revolution and what this revolution is going to look like is critically important to actually making it happen in the material world. Okay, so here's my question for you. Yeah. Is, is there, a, how does one intervene at yep. the culture of everyday life, the small c culture? Is that possible? Oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, yeah, I think you can. I mean, I think you, you, we do it all the time. The pronouns that you use, let's use something like that. that uh, he, she, and they. I mean, that's a very simple sort of intervention at the culture of everyday life because it changes the language we use when we refer to people in terms of their gender. It create, right. you know, it breaks down the gender binary. Right. So, yeah. Um, here's a here's another thought: Are those interventions at the level of everyday life? They have to be much more individual or personal, and so they have less of a chance of having a larger effect. I don't think so. And I think that's yeah. a good segue into where you're going, because, you know, I'm a sociologist. Right. And so we always talk about society. But, you know, Steve reminds me as a bourgeois individualist artist that actually <laughs> the society is just it's a construct and society is really made up of individuals. And so you can't impact society. What you have to do is we impact individuals who then make up society. And so we're going to turn it over to Steve a little bit because he's given a lot of thought to like how specifically can we target individuals and get them to change the way they think and then change the material that they do. Right. And yeah, so I'm coming from an art school background where I'm making artworks and I want to know that this is actually having an impact. And so when I found information like this, it's like, oh, this is how you impact individuals. This is how, you know, to, to, We've talked on this webinar before to make changes to change people's individual behavior. Without that, you are not necessarily making progress. There's many ways to approach it, but in the end, the result is changes in behavior. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm taking a couple different theories here of social psychologists and combining them and um, turning them into a form that I think artists and activists can understand and not social psychologists, but if there are any social psychologists that ever watch this, I'm asking your for forgiveness now, because like the people that came up with these theories spent years researching them and like won awards and stuff, and I'm just changing you're the just, terms. Just, and, you're just trashing. Yeah, I just like, oh, I like that part and change it around. No, come on, come on, Steve. We always say that what is art? Art is a combination of ideas that came before it. Right. Yeah. So I'm adapting these ideas. So there's there's two there's a few different here. One's called the theory of planned behavior. The other one is called the theory of reasoned action. 
one sort of led to the other, and then I'm taking a third one. And so anyway, I'm calling it the theory of planned reason behavior. Um, that's my version. Um, and what the theory of planned reason behavior is, is looks at like, how do people make decisions? And then how do they change those decisions, right? So uh, if we want to change people's behaviors and change their, the way, how they're making decisions, they have to do that. How do they go about that? How do individuals change? How does change happen? Right. Okay. And so, that's, that's important because Steve, you're totally interested in behavior, but in order for behavior to change, something has to come before it, right? Yes. Yeah. So what informs people's behavior and how does that change come about? And that's what this looks at. And what I'm really excited about this because this is something we don't often get to, we haven't been able to fit in our live workshops in years. Yeah. And we weren't able to fit in our book either. And so we get to talk about okay. it. Yeah. Um, and I have my notes. Okay. So, um, so we start with behavior because behavior is the, the outcome that we look at, right? That, that is, you know, it's our shorthand for change. Um, change comes from behavior in this model, in this lens, right? Um, and what is driving people's behavior in this model is their intention. Right. So the idea here is they want to do the behavior and so they do it. If they didn't want to do it, they wouldn't do it. That no one, we're not talking about anything where someone is um, forcing someone to do something by violence or, you know, through some sort of legal obligation, right? Like these are behaviors that people make because they choose to make them. Right. I mean, this is important. We're artists, we're not gun manufacturers. And we're not senators, right? We don't have those tools at our disposal. So what we do is we can influence how people think, right? And, yeah. feel. and I think there's something too that's respectful of the audience. Mm -hmm. Like we're not, we're, we cannot control people and they're not making foolish decisions because of their lack of education. They're able to reason they're thinking this through and they have an intention and then they do something, right? So um, they're not making arbitrary choices, they're making choices based on their own internal reasoning. So what is what influences that reasoning? What influences that intention? And this is where um, there's three parts. It's um, attitudes, norms, and what Steve and I call, because we changed this theory very recently, <laughs> Um, to adapt our, our uh, purposes, a uh, sense of agency. So I'm going to go through them one by one. So let's look at attitude. Attitude is how a person feels about a behavior. So how they feel about performing it, how they feel about doing this. And Steve and I were talking about voting as an example, yeah. right? Boring, um, but it works. Yeah, so that's Steve's attitude about boring, uh, voting, is that it's boring and it works. Um, <laughs> for me... <laughs> I have, um, this can be how they feel about doing it, how they feel about um, what will happen as a result, um, and how do they evaluate the behavior according to those feelings. Whether or not their evaluation is correct, whether or not they're right, it's how they feel about it. Right? That, and I think that's key because you, we, people, as you've explained to me, Steve, they make up their own minds about things. And we can tell them over and over, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. But unless we change, go back a step and change those attitudes to get them to that decision, it's not gonna make any bit of difference. Right. So if we were talking about voting as our example, like your attitude is boring, but it works. Mine is like- I actually meant that as an example for, the, for this webinar. <laughs> That's cool. I'll, I'll, it works for my attitude about voting too. <laughs> Um, so mine is like, um, I feel my attitude about voting is like, it is a sense of duty, like, and an obligation, like, uh, it doesn't matter whether or not it works, I'm going to do it, you know? Um, but if we think about more specifically, what will happen, um, that I will be one of many people that influence policy. That's how I think about voting. And my evaluation of what I think will happen is like, I should probably be a part of that. This is a one way that I participate as a citizen, right? So anyway, we could look and analyze at people's attitudes about voting or about any other behavior, right? And you look at what do they, th what do, what do they think will happen and how do they think about 
what will happen, right? So an, another attitude about voting could be like it's takes a it's a it takes a long time. You have to wait in line, and in the end, it doesn't matter, right? So what will happen is I'll be bored. I'll have to wait in line, and evaluation is a waste of time, right? That's another attitude. Okay, and that's going to affect how someone intend whether or not someone intends to vote. Just as my attitude affects how I intend to vote. Okay, I've over explained this. Here we go. Um, so norms. Norms are um, social norms. We survive in a cultural context, right? So what do the other people in our cultural context think? What is the subjective, you know, uh, uh, normal behavior for those around us? It, what they said this, like the small C culture, right? Yeah, like what's everyone else doing when I look around? Like what, is it, what does it seem like? Not me, but it, everyone else does. Um, and then do we believe the opinions of the people who are important to us? What do we and what do we believe about those opinions? So who, who are the people that influence us and how do we feel about that? And how motivated are we to comply with those norms? All those things fit under the category of norms, right? So let's go back to our voting example. So if I drive by the voting station and there's a good number of people, I see all my neighbors walking over there in the morning, they wave to me, they're like, just go vote, right? That implies that we all vote and we all expect you to too. Um, the I voted sticker, I have always thought is a really great thing. People get excited about that. And it also serves as a reminder to everyone you see that wears it, that's like, yeah, this is what we do, right? Um, so, okay, so that's norms. Um, and so we can think about both what is happening, uh, what seems normal, and then how we feel about it. There could be a, a normal attitude in the area about um, not voting, and I could feel like that's wrong, right? So it's not necessarily that I go along with everything. So there's what Gramsci said was common sense, bringing yeah, Gramsci that's back in, right? That's a good way to put it, yeah. But it's common sense about other people. Attitude is about you, okay. So the last one is um, sense of agency. And this is a fancy sociological term that Steve and I are very fond of. And it's like, what, whether you believe you have the ability to do this, that you have the power, that what you do will, will make a difference, right? So this is the third factor, and it's based on people's perception of their ability, right? So, um, we can look from the outside and say, hey, you know, the polls are open from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. It's three blocks from your house. It takes 20 minutes. You absolutely have time to do this today, right? If we mapped out your day and did all the logistics, this is possible, right? But a person might feel like my day today is a nightmare. I have to be at work early for this meeting. I have to take three kids and make their lunches and drop them off at daycare and pick them up and blah, blah, blah. There is no way that I have 20 minutes or what feels like 40 minutes to get over and vote today. I can't do it. Yeah. I can't do it. Yeah. Regardless of what is true, it is a, a sense of what, what you believe is possible. Okay. So those are the three parts. Now, we can't make anybody do anything right? How do we make change happen in individuals? Our ability to make change in individuals is by um, intervening at these three different points, right? So, Steve, if I'm a social psychologist, I kind of, I, I get what, what I would do, right? Uh -huh. um, or an educator, I, I think I'd know what to do in most of these cases, but what, what is an artistic activist to do? Like, how do we take all this information and, like, use it to make more effective art okay i was i spent a lot of time in seattle last fall and there was a bridge in fremont and i would ride i brought a bike and i would ride a bike from where i was staying to this office and on the bridge as you go over the bridge there's a counter of how many people on a bike have crossed the bridge and it shows you like you're not alone in this commute there are like thousands of other people and it's like sort of like a you know, let's see how high we can get the number thermometer kind of thing. Say we made that for the polling station, mm -hmm. right? And we were able to project that on the clouds above the whole neighborhood and say like, look, 
we're at this percentage, this many people have voted in your neighborhood already, we want to get it to 100, right? that changes the sense of norms. It might even change people's attitude where it's like, oh, this is sort of fun. It's this thing I'm participating in with the community. Um, another thing um, we could, inter so anyway, you can think of these creative interventions that would um, change people's yeah, I mean, attitudes. And, I could see um, even like sort of so, some sort of performative something or another which would actually sort of lessen the resistance that people might have towards their sense of agency, like I can't do it, you know? Um, and, and perversely, I'm thinking about traffic mimes, you know, like Antonis Makos' uh, traffic mimes in Bogota, Colombia. They, in some ways, what they were doing was they were showing people how to do something. In this case, how to be civil in traffic. But you could have, I'm not gonna say mimes would work here, but you could have some sort of performative, like, hey, this is actually how you can vote. It's not that hard. This right. is what you can do. And make it creative. Or as you say, think of a creative way to change the material conditions that make someone think that it's just not possible for them to get there, like offer a, a childcare, right? I mean, this would be a more sort of activist side of things, but it does yeah. take creative thinking to think like, hey, we're gonna have voting day childcare you can drop your kid off for 40 minutes, get over to the, you know, maybe it's near the polling station, um, things like that, right? Like it takes creative thinking in order to think of ways of influencing this. And you could actually combine them by like having that creative childcare where they actually produce posters which change <laughs> norms and actually change attitudes about like if kids are telling you to vote, you probably should vote. Right, right, yeah, yeah. So. Here's the deal. We're going to open this up to questions. So if you have questions, you can start typing them in. The other thing I want to ask, which is, you know, you and I are just riffing off the top of our heads. We're not the only ones that can do this. The people in the audience can. What are ways that we could affect attitudes, norms, or a sense of agency around people voting that would affect how they behave, right? Or their behavioral intention, what they choose to do, right? What are ways that we can intervene at the level of attitudes, norms, and, and sense of agency? So we'll take questions, we'll take examples, we can read them out over. Um, while we are waiting, for, oh, they're already here, okay. So um, let's see, uh, Anne says, I recommend Mark Stern and Susan Seifert's Civic Engagement in the Arts, Issues, conceptual, Conceptualization, and Measurement. I will post that title in the notes. Awesome. Um, when we archive this, they get much more nuanced, concrete about the different theories for ways which art can spur civic engagement. And thank you for that link. I'm also going to drop some links into the notes about how these theories work. And, and um, so you can dig a little bit deeper. Um, and you have written some other comments, but I'm going to skip over to Select here. It seems that Me Too and Black Lives Matter are both hitting big C and small C, but do you think either of these movements? Um, see big culture and little culture are linking effectively for real change do you think the cycle is happening they're they're talking at both but yeah i, I think i and i'm think i want to go to black lives matter just because it's been around a little bit longer they're doing this in an excellent way which is basically both creating representations as a way to just start thinking differently about black lives even the name itself is basically a change in thinking um and so you know me too as well although i think that the Sort of artistic representations of me too are not right there yet you know hashtag does not exactly make a cultural shift but the cultural shift is definitely happening are they effective i mean i think it may be too early to know um my hunch is that particularly with me too that there's real i know just in my university for example for the first time they're taking sexual harassment really really seriously and have put tons of money into the title nine um, office here, which they've neglected for years and years and years, and that's a material change. So, yeah, I think it, I think it does happen, and it is happening. And what's great about it is there's a lot of public support for it, at least to say at my university for these material changes to have a robust office around sexual harassment. Great. So um, we'll take more um, questions or more ideas for how you could intervene in this um, our voting example. I'd like to hear those. Um, in the meantime, um, we have a couple things to tell you while we wait for 
uh, people to type and give them the chance to form those questions. So, by the way, I've read uh, the Mark Stern and Su Susan Seffert Civic Engagement in the Arts, and it is awesome. Uh, I'd say Animating Democracy is a whole series of, of publications. Um, very easy to find. All the publications are free, and they think very seriously and have for many, many years about how does change actually happen. Yeah, there. I mean, I'll just say again what we said at the top, which is these are a couple sort of tools you can use to look at this, and there are others. We have sort of others in our in our box of lessons, but we thought we pulled these out for today because we thought they would be helpful. So, okay, so we got a couple announcements um, while we get those questions in. Um, please go ahead and type those in. Um, the we've got three upcoming webinars um the next one is on february 23rd with the first female president of the united states margaret mccarthy yeah most people didn't know that we actually did elect a female president um in an alternate universe uh our friend margaret mccarthy a performance artist from san francisco who has basically been governing as the first female president yeah it's in a, sort of a parallel universe, but it's happening. And she's also a webinar participant, and we've we've helped talk to her. And now she's going to be on the other side of it and talk about that project and how it's working. Um, Rebecca is posting in a link so you can register to that one. The next one is our corruption masterclass. So if you want to be corrupt, um, this <laughs> is the place to learn. We have, um, you know, Probably, I think he would he would say this uh, from one of the most corrupt nations in the country, Nigeria. Is that fair? You think Sayin would uh, agree? Although there's big battles when we were in West Africa between the people from Guinea and Nigeria about who lived in a more corrupt country. It was a perverse sense of pride. Yes. So um, one of the top top uh, corrupt countries. He, Sayun has been fighting corruption within Nigeria and gave an awesome presentation when we were visiting. Um, uh west africa and we immediately like as soon as it was done i was like saying i would really love for you to do a webinar about this with our audience in the u.s because you're like three steps ahead of where we're headed <laughs> right. and um Both in terms of corruption and fighting corruption yeah and what it means like w the impacts of corruption which i think i think we're all still getting our heads around so um rebecca posted a link for that um Again, if you have questions, go for it. The last one is March 9th, Larry Ouch. This is um, with Mar Marlene Our Ramirez Marlene. And she's going to be talking about humor and activism, which is a subject dear to my heart. Yeah. And she has been part of a Latinx um, comedy troupe for quite a few years and is one of the most uh, serious thinkers we know about, the, about humor and the place of humor um, in political activism. So join us for these three. Um, and we have any more questions? Yes. We have more questions. Um, I, and I have another announcement. Let me, I'll, I'll get through the other announcements and then we'll see if any other questions come through. But Andrea has a question that, um, sure. that Rebecca there it is. has identified. So, so uh, I, we are looking for part-time help. Oh, yes. yes. The, the big announcement that we have, um, two very part-time positions for people that are in New York City or preferably Hudson Valley area. Um, we have just a little bit more work than we can handle right now. And uh, we're looking for some people to help out. Um, Rebecca will post a link to the job listing so you can get the details. If you, if this is not for you, we totally understand. It needs to be a great match. But um, if you know somebody, please pass it along to them. We'd appreciate it. Uh -huh. um, and then the last thing, of course, before we answer questions is, uh, you know, we are a nonprofit organization and we do, we're doing this because we love it. And if you love it too, you can donate and we appreciate it. So, so um, a yeah. A question from Andrea. Okay. So if change happens at the individual level, right, that's sort of the baseline then goes mm -hmm. up to society, culture, material, so on and so forth. How do we effectively influence the individual politician and the 1% richest individuals to start making decisions that are good for society and not just them? Uh, regulation, and if not that, you know, weapons. <laughs> okay, okay, true, <laughs> but we're artistic activists. I mean, this is a great question yeah. because my first thing is, is the only way is through regulations and perhaps the guillotine. Uh, but that's not in our wheelhouse. 
Uh, once so they as see that, characters, once they see that they're e we're eating them, then they will fall into line. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I think my answer, I get my answers quick, is uh, that you think of individual behavior in, term of, in terms of your target, right? So you, you can say, all right, the behavioral intention and the norms around <laughs> the ultra wealthy are not what we'd like them to be. How do we change them? And I think a lot, there's been a lot of work on that. And we work with a group called United Fair, Fair, uh, Fair Economy, United for a Fair Economy. And they have a group called Responsible Wealth that is made up of millionaires and billionaires who do not like the fact that the, of how much money they're allowed to keep, how the economy works, that they're allowed to be as rich as they are. And they're helping change that culture among the wealthy. Yep. So that's one example. Steve, what were you going to I was going to say the work that Becca and Jason are doing with the Museum of Natural History, particularly around um, trying to get museums to dump the Koch brothers from their boards of trustees. And what they're, they, what they're leveraging is that very wealthy people want to be socially accepted. They want to walk into a cocktail party and people say, hey, you know, great work that you're doing. And if you make them toxic and you make their politics toxic and they can't be on these board of directors of museums and so on and so forth, it gives them culture and prestige. It actually, while it may not change the Koch brothers, it makes other people think twice about the politics they might want to associate with. Um, I'm going to read this question from Zeph, which I think is great. And um, it's, do social psychologists think people are more motivated by positive reinforcement of new attitudes and norms or by negative ones? For example, scapegoating of others and yeah. negative campaigning focused on a clear enemy. You answer and then I'll, I'll follow up. <sighs> Well, I hope you have a better answer. I do. I just think it's a great question. Yeah. Um, I, I know a little bit about fear campaigns and research around fear campaigns. Um, most fear campaigns don't don't work that well. There's a few rare exceptions. Um, there's like the Montana. If you want to see some really scary anti-drug ads, like haunting nightmare horror movie quality um, anti-drug ads, the Montana Meth Project. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, I think that's it, right? Montana meth. Yeah, the, the teeth. Oof. And those ones worked, but but it's exceptional, right? However, if you're trying to influence uh, an individual, you know, this is something we could probably research. Um, I think it's a great question. That my answer would be is that it. it and I think probably I, oh, I won't say social psychologists would say this because I don't know, but. My, my guess is that they would say, you know, it's, it's a very case by case. And if you're trying to influence an individual, you might have a good sense like, okay, if we shame and embarrass them. Um, but I think usually the way in practice I think about this is like, okay, if we're going to go negative, we need to offer positive. So if we're going to shame and embarrass this person, we also need to offer them a reward. So you can do this and you'll be embarrassed or you could do this and you'll be a hero. Yes. What was the name for they gave that in Guinea? You could um, name and shame and then name and fame. Name and fame. Exactly. So um, the my answer was going to be about ethics, which is even if fear is more effective and negative is more effective, we always have to think about what kind of world do we want to bring into being? Do we want to you know shame people into doing right and use you know scary images? to move them into correct behavior and correct thought? Or do we actually want a world that people want to join and want to become part of and show a vision of a world that, that, that leads people as opposed to sort of pushes people? And so that's something we always have to think about is, yeah, it might be more effective to use fear, but ethically, do we want a society built on fear? Because that shit yeah. comes back to haunt you. I mean, I think I've heard it described as like short-term gain. Yeah. Right. Like you can have a sort of short term impact, but it might not be effective long term. Um, exactly. Steve, you want to pick another, the next one? Yeah, sure. Uh, da, 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 da. OK. Let's see. OK, well, we haven't heard from Beverly. OK, if voting is perceived as a hacked form of power, we need to support other forms of intervention, 
more spectacles, public flash mobs, installations, projections that provoke public and embodied conversations hosted by activist artists. We need more kitchen table activism, face-to-face -face conversation, and ways to get people to cross boundaries that have become polarized. Voting bypasses that need. And so what Beverly's saying is that, mm -hmm. yeah, that behavior of voting, which we just threw up as, I think it was a boring but helpful um, example, um, that in a way, that led us into a certain path of thinking. But if we, we don't have to think about that final outcome as something as boring as voting, it can be getting people to participate in sort of direct democracies and so on and so forth. And maybe that's one of the ways, and we've always said this, Steve, that creativity doesn't come with just the tactics. It comes with thinking what the outcomes are as well. Yeah. And I think Beverly yeah, said a so good job. What is the world that you're hoping that election um, would bring about? And then are there other ways of bringing about that world? Um, not to say that that doesn't include voting, but we don't want to make that the only focus if we're being good about goals, which is in webinar number three, I want to say. Nice. Uh, if you want to, if you have not watched them all, the um, the one like the crash course to organizing is a good um, intro to yeah. thinking about goals and objectives and that, that kind of uh, approach. Um, all right, so I think we've got, there. these were great questions. I think we've got them. Um, I just want to, uh, Rebecca's putting up a link to all the webinars. Um, we will, you'll get an email about this tomorrow with your own copy of this video if you registered. Um, that's a good reason to register for the other ones too. You'll get little reminders about them happening. If you're not sure you can make it, you can still register. It doesn't, doesn't change, doesn't cost us anything. Um, we'd rather you may become than, um, uh, and come, then not come at all. Um, and the, I'm excited about the next few that we have. This is oh, like I a know. classic. This is a classic webinar. You and I. I know, I know. And, and now this we're getting like the old days. It is like the old days. But I think, you know, we got to change for the times. And so we're bringing in some really exciting people. Right. I, I like when you bring in exciting people because as excited I am about your ideas and my ideas, I know your ideas almost as well as I know my ideas. Um, and it's always good to get new ideas in here. And so yeah. again, in rapid succession, we're going to have the President of the United States of America, first right. female president. Uh, we're going to have our amazing Nigerian comrade be talking about corruption and then comedy, hilarious yeah. with Marlene. And um, yeah, Rebecca threw up the link for the webinars and donate there. And um, Zeph pointed out, I just noticed that too. Um, I like how you both have the word utopia um, in the visible in the background of your offices. <laughs> <on> the <laughs> yeah, well, you outed us. It works out. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, All right. Uh, so that's it. it for today. Onward to utopia. And. Yeah. Um, and we'll see you all next week. Toodaloo, and thanks for joining.